I'll come into this position, palpate here, and pull the <coughs> caudal bone forward, which of course is a relative left rotation. So both of those are perfectly acceptable techniques. I don't think that's very good because it brings in too many joints, but certainly coming over the lower part of the rib cage with the arm on the anterior aspect of the chest, our hands coming round here, very, very good technique, wonderful technique for mobilizing. And what I'd like you to do is to try very much to use the same techniques for mobilizing as we use for testing. It's just simpler instead of having all sorts of different techniques for different procedures that we do. This seems to be very satisfactory. It's not a compromise in any way. It's simply doing this as a matter of degree instead of going around and doing it a little bit more strongly if I were doing it as a mobilization. So this is a very, very useful kind of procedure to do. So work your way down and then sort of come and just work the lower one around here if you want to test that. You just have to check and change the position of your fingers to sense the caudal bone moving against the cranial or the cranial bone moving against the caudal. If you have any problems with that, myself or my colleagues will just go over that with you. So, those are the ways, I feel, of testing for intervertebral joint motion. Any suspicion of hypermobility will go on to the specialized tests then for testing for hypermobility, instability, and the way that the segment can absorb various stresses of compression and rotation and so on. But we'll leave that for a couple of days. We'll try and keep bits and pieces together um, so that they're sort of convenient. So just in revision, we need to either one leg, I tend to do it with one so you're not holding on, and I find that you can hold the patient's thigh on yours so you can actually use both hands on the back here, giving a little bit more focus to where you are just on a sort of single joint like that. I find that very useful, but make sure you don't rotate. Extension, you have to basically use both legs now and use a little bit of a translation glide as well as trying to increase the lordosis by the motion. And work up there. Side bend, legs off the side to give a little bit of impetus to the movement and then with a little rock on the pelvis we can get a very, very good side bend movement, legs back, rotate, and I can now do a perfectly good rotation movement down to say 3-4, then I could hold there and have a look at rotation in the lower movements if I didn't want to work through the upper lever all the way down. Your thumb being the movement my thumb, factor there. Yes, my thumb now is placed on the upper side and this one is coming this way, so it's just sensing that this caudal spinous process is rotating this way. But of course we know it's the relative movement. We always describe everything as to what the upper bone would do if it was moving. So with this technique, would your moving hands be pushing the uh, caudal segment? And I'm rotating the caudal section actually to the, to the right. But it's still a left rotation movement because it doesn't matter whether I do that or that. That's still the same relative movement. So in the first case, I'm pushing this back here, and I'm feeling here and detecting that going back. In the last case, when I'm pulling this forward, this is staying still, and I'm feeling that come forward that way. But it's still a left rotation, whether I move the caudal bone to the right or the cranial bone to the left. It's still called left rotation, so as we know. Moving in, I don't know if axis going, yes, uh, yeah. So I'm trying to visualize that axis and just pull across that axis. There. Or push down, sort of just thinking of this axis here, best I can. Rather than just pulling like that, which tightens up immediately because it's not the normal plane. So I hold back there at the oblique thing and just try and produce that relative movement here. Any questions on that? We're looking for end feel. 
We're looking for development of spasm. We're looking for all of the things that seem to suggest that this isn't moving and why isn't it and what's the end feel or the barrier as it's called in um, osteopathic circles to our movement. Right, let's try those and see where we go. The glide movements, and that was a good point that Brian made when we're doing this. What are you expecting to find here? Very little. You should just feel that there's just the tiniest little movement. What you usually find if there's a hypermobile joint, it, there's a big space because of the tension of the supraspinous, uh, the, or let's say the posterior ligamentous structures is less, so it feels those as a bigger space, and you get a little bit greater motion. And as most of you felt, when we're getting up into the thoracolumbar junction, they've got lots of times, there's big spaces there, lots of movement at that level. So we are doing a movement through the femur. The angle of the femur doesn't change, but the direction of our push changes a little bit in terms of the direction of the disc. And we're just translating parallel to that disc angle. So there's one finger in between there. Yes, I'm just feeling in between. And one just above. And all I'm trying to feel, I'm, I'm stabilizing a little bit with this. Not major. Not like we would if we were trying to produce an extension movement when I'd be really holding and pushing. It's tests are much easier. So this is just this very gentle movement and just oscillating through my hand. So this is a subtle kind of motion. The points that we made as far as flexion or any of these movements is to try and keep the spine in neutral before we start. Double leg movements are okay. I mean you can certainly do them and support everything on your legs like this. But one leg movement seems to do just about as well. So why use more weight than you have to. But doing this and rocking, tie. you know, I mean it's possible to keep absolute control here and then we can just do that little bit extra movement here as we work our way up, just looking very subtly. So I'm not having to work very hard. We did make the point when we went into extension that it's a little bit of a combination between that movement and that movement. So we're compromising a little bit with extension, but we're getting, we're simulating a movement that's close enough to extension and it seems to fit in that when we have a difficulty in extension, then this, what's effectively an increase of lordosis, although it's not identical in every way, in this particular regard it seems to work pretty well. So that we can really sense, you've got some quite a bit of mobility here, is that sore over there? No. Go on, say it's so bright. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we go. And so now, the other thing is, and especially, um, especially talking to Kathy, is that one of the problems that you know we have, it's okay. I'm t showing you a technique. You know, this superior physical specimen I have with all this working out <laughs> that I used to do. Um, and I think with women, you've got to sort of be. A little bit smarter because sometimes the brute you just haven't got the brute strength so you look at the principles and this is when you have to use your bodies obviously more than just arm strength because you won't have the arm strength and it's going to kill you so with all these things the more you can use your body strength the better it's going to be so you just have, women have to be smarter but that's why you were born smarter I guess because you need to be. All right. So the next thing, I was telling a little group here, one of my, uh, I was invited to go to Saudi Arabia. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to go to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and um, so one of my colleagues went, I rang him yesterday, and I sort of asked him how he went. Oh, he said, very interesting experience. He said, I've told him you'll go next time. And <laughs> he had 40 people in the class, like 20 men and 20 women. So I said, well, how did that work? Oh, he said, well, the men worked on one side of the screen, and the women worked on the other side of the screen. So I said, well, how many of you were there? He said, well, there's just me and a female instructor. So the female instructor that he had didn't really know the techniques, but she knew a little bit more than the other per 
people because she'd trained in Canada, but she didn't know anything about muscle energy or anything. So she worked with the women on the first day. So I said, well, did you ever see what went on behind the screens? Well, he said on the second day, he said the, the women felt a bit more comfortable with me, so they invited me to the other side of the screen. So I said, well, what happened then as far as what dress did they wear? Oh, he said they all wear the, the, the robes. Nobody sort of saw the back at all. They were all working through the robes. Isn't it interesting, different societies? So he finally got on the other side of the screen, <laughs> but still working through the clothing. So that's going to be an interesting experience, and I really don't know whether I want to go. <laughs> so here we go, and we're doing that um, thing. Now, as far as the side flexion was concerned, we had those couple of things, which I didn't demonstrate originally very well, because I was talking too much. So we come down here, then we can utilize this by putting us back into the straight position and just rocking a little bit. If we've got some difficulty with the legs going over or if we've got two heavy legs and it, you know, this is terrifically hard work with it. You know, you're not going to concentrate on what you feel. So the alternative to that would be to slightly bend the lower leg, straighten the upper leg and then you haven't got so much to deal with. And for the women, you know, essentially to use that rock of the body is really quite an important aspect of this. And the higher we get, of course, then we're going to come up above the iliac crest and then I can just push down a bit. And once we've done this, we've done a lot to do with how we're going to mobilize. Because I'm just going to work out whether it's muscle-based or whether it's joint-based and am I going to mobilize it or am I going to use muscle-based techniques. That's what it's going to be all about. So we don't have to learn thousands of separate things. The rotation, as I said, we can do it from below, right upwards, or from above, right downwards. But it seems to me to be reasonable that when we get to five and to four, that probably we use the shortness of the lower lever. So I just sort of come forward like that and just feel what's happening. Above, it seems quite convenient to move the body in the way that it often does move, which is from above downwards. And with this one, I'm going to essentially use my forearm on the rib cage like this and use my body just to sort of rock backwards and forwards like this. Yeah, he's got a, a really big space between here, but it's, you know, it's not particularly, that doesn't cause you any great stress, does it? So it's just one of these things that's not showing up. It's a good job we've spotted this now, though, because we can prevent this getting worse in the future. As long as you come every day for six months. <laughs> so here's a thing that you think, ah, oh, this is going to be symptomatic, and it isn't symptomatic. Very interesting. It's never had any problems with it, so let's leave it alone. <laughs> it's not going to be doing anything to it. A little bit stiff below, I suppose, if you wanted, you could kind of justify mobilizing that, but of course you wouldn't be seeing him if he had not got a problem, because he wouldn't be in your clinic. When we're sort of walking around here, we can find all kinds of abnormalities in each other, can't we? That largely are asymptomatic. And so we would leave them. Because under different circumstances, we'd never even know about them. So this very close precision of movement is really a very important aspect of testing. The less work you can do, the more precise can be your technique. And you know, what you're doing at this moment is you are making contact with this patient, aren't you? You are letting them see just how good you are, which means that they're gaining confidence. And so this way of handling without causing pain, and when you sort of do cause pain, say, I just want to stress this, oh yeah, they are perfectly able to sort of detect now that we're taking it into this segment and stressing it a little bit as to what is happening. Whereas if I'm kind of going like this and everything's moving, it's, this is hurting all the time anyway. But the more precise we can be, the more they'll trust you and the more you'll feel. So I think that this is really quite precise movements. All right, we'll have a short break for two, three minutes. You can use that for active recall. Anything you want to write down, here's the opportunity to do it, so that in three days' time, you'll be able to remember that we did this subject. <laughs> <laughs> emphasizing the lever arm placed in flexion or extension and then we can come back to sort of 
annotate these particular points here. We've just done a rotational movement, but we will sort of see how we can do it into extension or how we can hold it in flexion. Which means that if we find it missing in one but not the other, that would be the one to actually produce our technique to improve that movement. Now then, was that a break, do you think? Sufficient break? Two minutes more? Of course, Kent. <laughs> Kent's going to the bathroom. <laughs> there, there was a question raised in doing the rotational one. Paper that's in the notes somewhere. Sideways on. This is mind mapping time. And what I'd like you to do is to think of the relevant kinesiology of the lumbar spine. What matters, what happens, how are we going to use it? So, have a little brainstorm. This is a brainstorming kind of thing, except you're writing it on paper so you've got some record of your thought processes. So if you're using your lined paper, use the back of it, but Dave did put some, put it in everybody's notes, or just my notes? Did you put the plain paper? Okay. Oh, in the brown folder. Special to show it's special. Okay. So we're going to do kinesiology of the spine. Spend a few minutes now bringing up all the stuff that you think is important, and then we'll have a little discussion on it. So work in your groups. Comes like three megabytes of information in your heads. Okay? So let's just have a look in reasonable terms. I think the best source of information for this is in Tomey and um, on Bogduck's book on clinical anatomy of the lumbar spine, another book by Livingston, little thin book, not very expensive, 20 bucks or 25 dollars or something. Wonderful little book. Okay, now all we need to do for this kind of course is not to go over everything that could be done in the lumbar spine, but to focus on stuff that we need to use at this stage. That's what we should be doing. Okay, now I don't want to sort of say, but just so that we include it and make sure that we are not missing bits out. We're dealing with the segment, aren't we? And this is for us when we communicate. The segment's got all kinds of aspects, but certainly it's got a neural arch aspect, and certainly it's got a discal body aspect. And Certainly we needn't sort of talk about this, but the interesting parts about the obliquity of the fibers here, and we've always kind of thought that if we rotate it draws everything together, and this seems not to actually happen. The ability of the disc or the whole segment to absorb rotation is probably far greater than the rotation stresses that you can put on in terms of treatment, which makes us feel quite safe, even with manipulating. When it comes to mobilizing, then it makes it very safe because we're sensing end feel all the time, and we would stop if we were forcing anything inappropriate. We know that this can, will resist any movement of the spine, but it will certainly resist elongation and it will certainly resist compression. And compression is resisted by two forces. One is increasing the pressure within the nucleus, which then dissipates its action into the annulus. And this is, of course, can't be compressed because of its liquid nature. But the other thing is that the annulus itself is quite well adapted to weight bearing. Just the bulk of the annulus itself can resist a lot of downward pressure. And that when we squeeze the disc together, very often you get fractures within the bone before this starts to break up. So this is a very, very efficient system. The other thing that we should always think about, of course, is the neural arch mechanism. Here's a picture from Farfan's book, which shows some important things for us to bear in mind, is that 
I don't even need to say this to you, of course, but I will, just for completeness sake, but that as we come down from above downwards, this normal sagittal arrangement is changing more into a coronal arrangement at the lumbosacral junction. This particular thing is very well adapted to absorbing rotational strains, isn't it? When we get into a coronal place thing here, where it's not so well adapted for that, but much, much better for absorbing anterior shear forces, which are the way, or which are the responsibility very much of the lumbosacral junction, then the rotation is looked after by the iliolumbar ligament mechanism. So although this might not be as efficient, the iliolumbar ligament is very efficient at absorbing rotation. And if you look at the arrangement of the transverse process on L5, it's totally different to the transverse process at any other level. It comes from the body, not just the pedicle of the bone. It's a much, much bigger structure and it flares out into the body which gives you this impression of the importance of this iliolumbar ligament absorbing mechanism. The problem with this, of course, is the tropism that occurs. The fact that in some cases we have a bone that is not equally sagittal on both sides and that the sagittal bone has become coronal on one side which of course when we're testing motion alters the amount of movement that we've got there but for that particular abnormality it's perfectly normal motion so that when we're testing a lot of this stuff it can't just be related to quantity of movement it's got to be related to some extent unfortunately to quality of movement. If we've got asymmetry, which is fairly normal in the spine, then asymmetrical movement is going to follow asymmetrical form, isn't it? It's got to do it. And are we smart enough to feel one degree difference of movement? Most unlikely. But if we're going down one level after the other, even though there's a difference between the movement that takes place at L3, 4, and 4, 5, and 5, S1, for example, in side bending, between 3, 4, and 4, 5, there's such a gentle transition that we shouldn't feel very much difference if everything is moving well. So that quality of movement and of relating from above downwards and then one side to the other is an important aspect of when we're testing and what is the end feel and what is the muscle reaction and so on. So these are important points to us. Now then, let's just look at a number of things. First of all, let's look at what happens with loading through compression, me in this position. In other words, why is the lordosis so important? Other animals don't have it. They seem to sort of get along. They've not got the pure bi bipedal gait that we have, and much, much more with chimpanzees, you know, like this. They've got much more of a kyphotic lumbar spine. We've got this lordotic lumbar spine. It's related to the action of walking, but also it's very good for distributing the weight. Here's a picture from Bogduck and Tomey's book. We can see that the neural arch mechanism and the body disc mechanism is very much responsible for the absorption of this and that the bodies go closer together with the nucleus and also the annulus dissipating the force but also posteriorly this zygopophyseal joint here the superior or the, sorry, the um, inferior facet of the superior vertebra is coming down onto the lamina below and then distributing it through this three and two, a lamina contact. If this bangs down like that, of course, this can create problems here of periostitis and so on, of an inflammation. But normally, this mechanism is very good at sharing out the load from here to here. Now, if we haven't got that lordosis and we can come into this position, this is going to be seriously compromised. 
And Adams and Hutton wrote a very good article on the zone of safety, they called it. And they felt that the more restricted was the range of motion between kyphos and lordosis, the less and less was your zone of safety. You could not dissipate in different places across the segment because you've got such a restricted range of motion in the segment. This might be one of the major important features of Mackenzie's protocol of you know, passive extension in lying of just reobtaining some of that particular motion. So here we see the weight bearing between the body and the annulus and this facet as it comes down onto the lamina. But if it comes down too fast or we force extension as we get compression, then we can get acute problems of synovitis and periostitis at that particular point here. And funnily enough, if we come too far into extension, we can get this kissing spine syndrome and we can get a great deal of irritability between the spinous processes and the posterior ligamentous structures which have been compressed and go into a reaction. So that's perhaps one of the causes of some of acute spine pain, particularly caused by compression and extension, which we pick up by coming into extension. So that's compressional loading. Next thing I'd like to just look at for a second is the motion of flexion. Here we've got the necessity to absorb translation as well as flexion. In A we see the neutral position. In B, we see the formation of the angular movement and this upward motion of the zygopophyseal joints. And then on this diagram, although it doesn't show it perfectly, the translation will be absorbed when this comes into contact with the superior facet of the inferior vertebra. Now, when I say it down, I mean it shows that perfectly well. But if we look at the zygopophyseal joints, of course, and we look at them from above downwards, we know that they are going to be arranged with a J shape. So that anterior part of the J is going to be a very important aspect, not just of it looking as if it contacts the front part, but because this is around in that particular fashion there and will absorb along that arch. If this erodes through degenerative changes, translation is going to be less effectively controlled. Now then, what do we know about flexion? Here's some really interesting things. That if I bend forward fully <coughs> in my lumbar spine, that's about it. That's my lumbar spine, fully flexed. Nearly all the other movement is going to be in the hip joints. So when we look at what happens in the lumbar spine, maximum flexion, generally speaking, the lumbar spine at the very most only straightens. Any flexion of angular motion, of definite angular motion, is probably only occurring at L1 or L2 or T12 L1. L5, S1 never even gets to the straight position. So when we're kind of talking about all this kind of flex going forward like that, the most we can get is a straightening. And this is why I reckon when we're doing anything in sitting, we should be working with patients at about this range, not taking them all down with flexion of the hips and everything. This is an unnecessary complication. So, like lordosis and extension being a similar movement, loss of lordosis and flexion have similarities, although they are not, in every regards, identical. But we can kind of use that principle to focus down to an individual bone when we're trying to do very specific techniques. So I think as far as we're concerned here, it's the translation